What is up my friends and how's it going and welcome to the 5th episode of our Salucid Let's Play series with your fellow comrade Summary. Let's go ahead and turn off those usual notifications and before we hop into the episode we are quickly going to have a recap of what transpired in the previous episode. And in the previous episode we had fought a two front war with the, the Armenians in the north and in Libya we tried to consolidate as much of Libya as possible. We are currently in a war against the Kyrene AK and uh, we are going to try to uh, you know secure our western frontier by consolidating our control over Libya. Libya. Meanwhile, in the northern parts, uh, we have managed to push into Hayastan. We have captured a couple of settlements in Bithynia at Pontus, namely Amasea, the former capital of the Pontic faction, as well as Trapezos. Meanwhile, in Hayastan, we have two out of the four settlements, and we are looking to initiate a war with the Kartli. Uh, they co currently control the capital of Hayastan, which is Tushpa, and of course, they even have access to the Gold Province, Armavir. Uh, we are going to go ahead and attack them. Meanwhile, in the Far East, we have the Bactrians who have declared war upon our satrapies. I have decided to peacefully integrate my satrapies. I'm going to do it in a combination of diplomatic intrigues using my characters, as well as the Timbe Trade Region submod, for which I will need most of my dignitaries, which are busy converting the province of Hayasdan to Hellenic. And once they have completed that task, I will then reassign them to acquiring regions from my satrapies and making sure that I am able to consolidate as much of the eastern territories as I possibly can. And then I will eventually have to face off with some of the eastern factions over here, such as the Bactrians, the Parthians, and even the Morians themselves. Uh, that being said and done, let us hop right into the episode. And the very first thing we want to do is check all of our characters, see if we can upgrade any of our characters. We have Thea over here, uh, who we can upgrade, and she is going to focus, of course, on uh, the economic aspect. So we're going to improve our commercial, our tax rate. But before we go ahead and improve our tax rate, we're going to have a quick look at our empire maintenance. And you can see the empire maintenance is pretty high. We have about minus 74 empire maintenance which is actually really high we have a decent amount of tax rate and slaves and now guys when it comes to choosing between an improvement between a tax rate or an empire maintenance i would always say if your empire maintenance is not at zero then pick empire maintenance because tax rate basically applies to the province of concern so in this case it applies singularly to egyptos however if you choose empire maintenance then it affects all provinces within your empire so empire maintenance is a slightly better thing to uh, you know to target uh, especially if you have a lot of empire maintenance issues so we're going to select both of our empire maintenance reductions that should bump it down to about 72 percent empire maintenance and that will increase our economy by a significant bit speaking of our economy we have 16,000 denarii in our treasury we are making about 13,000 denarii per turn and in my opinion my honest evaluation this is a pretty low mid-tier economy we want to be somewhere around 30,000 denarii per turn to start being comfortable as far as our economy is concerned however that's not going to be uh, you know easily attainable we are in the process of uh, upgrading the buildings in egyptos and that should help out a little bit egyptos itself is the highest uh, you know, province as far as economy is concerned. Our next competition is Hellas. Hellas, however, is divided between three factions. I, has, I have mentioned it before in the previous episode. Uh, the economical output of Egyptos is solely in our control. So we are making about 15,000 denarii from Egyptos alone. Of course, we have several other provinces. We have Bithynia at Pontus, which is, uh, you know, going to be specced as a food generation province. We have Asia. Asia, of course, we are holding back on that consolidation of the province because we're trying to maximize our growth rate which means uh you know we are trading off uh, current pleasure or current gain for a future much stronger future and this is pretty much uh, you know what all strategy games are about guys uh you really want uh, it's a lot to do with time management it's a lot to do with how uh, you know you make early game sacrifices so as to have a much more pronounced advantage in the later game and that's exactly what i'm doing here in asia of course i could go ahead and consolidate asia right away it's not going to be extremely hard to do i have to defeat a one 
uh, region faction such as Pergamon and I have to defeat another one region faction like Rodos and pretty much I can peacefully integrate Pessinus from my subject Lydia. So as you can tell, it's not going to be really hard for me to consolidate Asia. However, if I do that, then I will miss out on all that growth rate potential that all of these factions are providing to the province. And therefore, once I do consolidate Asia, uh, I will not have a very strong Asia. However, if I let these factions build up the regions within this province for me, then when I do inherit the province for myself, I get a much stronger Asia. So I am pretty much tanking my economy a little bit for now with the hopes of getting a much stronger province of Asia later down the line. And that is pretty much how you deal with any strategy game, guys. You want to kind of try to snowball as much as you possibly can. Uh, speaking about, uh, you know, uh, our current situation, as you can see, we have, uh, you know, we are at war with the Kyrene faction and uh, they have a full stack out here in the Libyan desert and I have uh, you know, two armies in the region. I have Stratos 2 Mesopotamia and Stratos 4 Cappadocia. Uh, currently, Stratos 2 Mesopotamia is in an ambush stance just outside the walls of Ammonium. Uh, however, it seems likely that this army will make a dash for Paratonian, so I will have to redirect my army to kind of try and intercept this army. Uh, basically, my idea is to try to get this army that is within the walled settlement of Kyrene to abandon the settlement, thereby uh, allowing my armies an easier time with dealing with the settlement. Uh, of course, I can go ahead and attack them directly. Uh, that would make things a lot harder. Um, however, in a strategy game, you really want to try to make things as easy for you as possible. Therefore, you can keep your momentum up and running. And I have explained momentum to you guys in the previous episode. Uh, basically, when I defeated uh, the Nasamones, I used a lot of momentum. I was able to defeat an army here. I was able to defeat an army right over here and take out a Gela without much of a struggle. So that's pretty much what we want to do. And speaking of momentum, we're just going to take a quick look before we dive any deeper into strategy. We're going to have a look at, of course, our family trees, our politics and so forth. So we do have our faction there at 236 Gravitas. He's still behind Alistair. As we mentioned in the previous episode, we want to him to have the maximum amount of gravitas because if he does not have that once our faction leader dies antiochus the first sorter um, he will no longer be the heir he will actually be passed over in favor of alistair who has a lot more gravitas so the very first thing we're checking uh, cross-checking to see that alistair doesn't have any of the gravitas generating abilities we're checking to see if antiochus the second can be promoted because keep in mind guys the higher you rank the higher amount of gravitas you generate per turn so that definitely helps and lastly what we can do is send gift to a political party not only to improve their loyalty but to gain two gravitas for the initiator in this case antiochus the second as you can see he has 236 gravitas so when we go ahead and improve the loyalty of let's say the royal philoi uh, they should get that plus two loyalty, but at the same time, we have increased the gravitas for Antiochus II. So we're going to keep doing this until we can overtake Alistair. And another way you can actually decrease uh, the gravitas of Alex, uh, Alistair is by, you know, engaging in some political intrigues that actually cost gravitas. Now, speaking of political intrigues, I could actually go ahead and assassinate a character. Now, this guy, um, you know, he is the leader of the Macedonian nobility. Uh, however, he is quite leveled up as well. So, you know, he's pretty good of a character, but he does have this really bad trait, which is hates barbarians. And that is basically giving us a minus six to the loyalty as of the moment, we don't really need a lot of party loyalty, but what we do need is to reduce the gravitas of this character. And the only action I see available to this character is the assassination. Uh, we can even spread rumors. And you know what? I'm actually going to try to spread rumors because um, rumors will decrease the authority of target, decrease the loyalty of target, might not make, uh, you know, the political party of concern extremely disloyal. Um, 
in comparison to assassinations. However, even assassinations has its benefit because, you know, by assassinating a faction uh, or a political party leader, I can get a successor that will have a better trait. However, in my case, the successor has the exact same trait, the hates barbarian trait. Um, so I am actually going to go ahead and just simply, uh, you know, spread a rumor against some of these guys. So let's go ahead and spread a rumor against this guy. This guy has quite a high, you know authority and i can't really do that so we're gonna go ahead and just do it for the faction leader that's gonna decrease their loyalty by a bit and actually kind of increase their loyalty that's actually really funny uh, however it has decreased alistair to 233 gravitas which means antiochus the second in the next turn should be able to overtake him realistically speaking uh, that being said and done as far as the government is concerned we are almost done reforming into an empire uh, and <clears throat> our loyalties are fine our public order is fine but we really need to you know focus on our influence our influence at the moment is that exalted uh, this is not a really bad influence to be at but we are getting minus three tax rate per turn however if we drop to the beloved not only do we get more public order we do get plus one tax rate per turn that so that uh, as a net total is a plus four tax rate per turn boost and four percent might not seem like much of course four percent of you know 13,000 denarii is just a little bit uh, you know, just a little bit over 400 to 500 denarii per turn. But guys, that is actually quite big. You know, you might scoff at it. That is actually quite big because 400 to 500 denarii per turn is actually going to maintain like, you know, two to three pikemen. So uh, it's nothing to scoff at really, guys. So apart from that, we can research technology. Let's have a look at our technology. We have researched quite a fair bit into construction. We have not done anything in philosophy and philosophy is something I really like to tackle earlier on uh, because it gives that cultural conversion boost as well as it improves your research rate, which means further technological research will be a lot faster. Uh, apart from that, we could also research into the economy branch, uh, improving our agricultural capabilities and food generation. However, for now, our food is at 40 two surplus which is well above the maximum that we desire which is 20 so i'm not really too concerned about our food meanwhile militarily speaking i have gone ahead and preemptively researched the thurios reforms and that is because we are very close to acquiring our thurios reforms which requires our imperium level to be at three and of course 50 turns to be played in the campaign and currently we are very close to the 50 turns requirement and our imperium as you know it we are an empire so it is uh imperium level five uh so that being said and done what we can do as far as technology is concerned is we can try to improve our army because we have that little bit of a breathing space we can try to even improve our dock because as you guys remember in the previous episode we had a little bit of a piracy situation that we couldn't really deal with and that is because you know we didn't have a really good ships in order to deal with it however that being said and done uh, we don't really have a very good economy so i don't really want to be uh, build a very elite fleet of ships as you can see if i build a fleet i'm going to be building an assault hexeris and a hexeris costs 600 denarii per turn to to maintain so that is quite a hefty fee to pay especially when your economy is not looking that good so instead i think i will be either going for management in which i will be you know decreasing the upkeep cost for my elephant units and i think that seems to be uh, you know the most logical choice and of course i can even go for the hellenization which will give me access to upgrade my barracks uh, or i will be going for the philosophy tree so i think for the most part we can have a very quick look at our buildings and see if uh, the philosophy tree kind of makes sense um, right now we don't have anywhere where i can potentially build with the exception of course i can build a um, let's see over here i could build an academia over here that gives me plus one uh, to my first class population which is quite nice or plus 0.6 rather 
Meanwhile, the Hippodrome gives me a plus 1.5 for my second class population. And in my opinion, as the Seleucids, that is much better because the Seleucid has a lot of elite units that actually come from the second class population. So, you know what? I am not going to focus on uh, the research part of things for now. Instead, what I am going to do is I'm going to focus on the military aspect. So, let's go ahead and select that. Uh, last or final look at our politics. I'm pretty happy with our politics. So uh, for now, I think what we need to do is we need to strategize what's going to happen in Hairston and with the Cartley in specific. With the Cartley in specific, you can see they have a full stack over here making its way towards Koron. And I could potentially get a significant, uh, you know, momentum over here. They don't have any units as far as I can tell that are near Tushpa. And I can really quickly just check that by moving my dignitary towards Tushpa. However, I don't want to do that because I really want to culturally convert Hairston as quickly as possible. As you can see, we are at 36.7% Hellenic, which means in about two turns, we should have Hellenic as the dominant culture, which will make expansion within the province a lot easier. However, what's the best way I can gain momentum in such a situation? And I'm going to give you guys a moment to think about it. Um, at your command. Alright, so basically guys, what I can do is I can try to bait this army into attacking Koron. And for those of you who had guessed that, then you've got it right. Another thing I am doing, and you might have noticed, is that I put Stratos 1 Seleucia into the port. Because in the next turn, what I could do with Stratos, uh, you know, 1 Seleucia is I could make a push towards Phasis. And from Phasis, I could then make a push towards Mesquera. Thereby, I could create a pincer attack on Armavir. Uh, basically, this army is going to be in ambush stance over here. We have a bunch of trees, which is really helpful as opposed to, you know, how we attempted an ambush in Ammonium. Uh, it is a desert province, so there's not really a high probability of launching a successful ambush. But when it comes to ambushes, um, you know, forests are the best things that you can hope for. As you can see over here, uh, if you mouse over the terrain, you can see it actually tells you your ambush chance. And if we are going to be in ambush stance, in uh, grasslands then you're going to have a 25 percent chance of success which is pretty low however if i mouse over a forest you see that little icon on the left side of the text coron you see that i have a 60 percent chance of launching that ambush and another thing to keep in mind when you're launching an ambush especially when you are you know kind of tempting the enemy ai with the capture of your settlement is you don't want to be too far away from your settlement you want to be within the zone of control of your settlement which you can see by the red area that is highlighted here so you don't want to exceed that zone so in case the enemy army uh, detects your ambush and bypasses your ambush and tries to attack the settlement they will still have to fight your army so uh that being said and done let's go ahead and move this guy um, our faction air and put him in that ambush stance and then we want to go ahead and attack the Kartli. Now the Kartli do not have any allies. Meanwhile, Phanagoria and the Archibosphorus are in a war against the Kartli. So we're going to try to attempt to join the war against the Kartli. Perhaps get a little bit of a payment in order to do so. And most likely they will not accept and that is because of our diplomatic reputation. However, they will accept Your if we ask them just point blank. So I think the situation up here in the north seems to be fine. Meanwhile, with this army over here, it can technically move towards Paratonian. It can technically move towards Ammonium. And I'm not entirely sure if I will be happy with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to move as close as I can to Paratonian without abandoning Ammonium and go into an ambush stance over there. So in the next turn, if they make a move towards Paratonian or they move a little bit closer towards Paratonian, I will be able to intercept that army. Um, that being said and done, what we also want to do in this turn is we want to engage in politics in order to acquire certain provinces from our uh, satrapy. So let's go ahead and send a diplomatic mission to Parsa. We're going to go ahead, do the same and send yet another diplomatic mission. And this time the diplomatic mission is going to be to, let's say, Parthava. And with that, I think I'm done with this turn. We can go ahead and level up this character over here. Give him even more uh, army upkeep cost reduction. Apart from that, we can also improve 
his replenishment rate and give him some access to some experience gain per turn. And speaking about elite armies, I almost forgot we are in the process of recruiting Silver Shield Pikemen with our newly newly reinstated Stratos 5 Egyptos. We're gonna go ahead. I want to get 10 Silver Shield Pikemen because I want to replace the Pikemen within the armies of my faction leader and my faction heir. Um, not only do I want to give them Silver Shield Pikemen, I also want to give them uh, you know, the better Syrian war elephants, which are basically the AOR versions of the Syrian war elephants. Of course, I do not have enough funds to even recruit those guys. And I am going ahead and recruiting uh, Silver Shield Pikemen, as you can see over here. That's decreasing my second class population quite significantly. Uh, however, the idea is to exchange the units, take the Bronze Shield Pikemen, march all the way back to the capital and disband them in the capital, thereby, uh, you know, replenishing that population. That being said and done, I think I'm done with this turn, so I'm going to go ahead and end the turn, and I will see you all in the next turn. Alright, so here we are in the end turn, and just as predicted, the Kartli have taken the bait, and our faction air is going to ambush their army, so let's just hop right into the battle, and I will see all of you guys in the battle. Alright, so here we are in the first battle, we have been ambushed, uh, we are ambushing the Kartli. We have managed to uh, line up all of our units uh, in particular order. We have our cavalry on the left and as you can see, uh, it's just a perfect uh, you know, deployment because whenever you ambush an enemy, you can obviously have the best deployment possible. Cavalry is taking out their en uh, the entire enemy missiles. Meanwhile, we have our elephants all the way in the back. They are trying to join the battle. Uh, of course, we have our front lines over here, and we are going to be a bit more aggressive with them. We're going to start pushing up. Hopefully, the enemy will push up to us. And once they engage, then, uh, you know, they will be in big trouble because we have our elephants units soon joining the battle. Meanwhile, all the way in the back, we have our Cretian archers, and they are actually prioritizing this missile cavalry unit because uh, missile cavalry unit is really hard to deal with. The only way you can deal with them is uh, typically through faster moving cavalry that can catch up to them or using uh, you know missile infantry as missile infantry have more range more damage output and as such can quickly shred this unit as you can see we are absolutely demolishing these guys so yep that things are looking great meanwhile over here on the far left flank you can see uh, we are you know completely decimating all of their missile units which is a good thing because we have a lot of pikemen and pikemen are incredibly vulnerable to uh, you know missile units but as you can see over here the battle is ongoing in the front lines and uh, you know we are not in any major threat for the most part we have almost all of our units at full strength meanwhile the elephants have finally caught up they are hitting the rear of the enemy front and uh, or the enemy front line rather and uh, things are not looking too good for the enemy units and uh, pretty much over here we are going to uh, you know get a very decisive victory through an ambush so ambush battles can be really really uh, you know powerful if you know how to uh, deploy your units with an ambush battle so the general strategy would be uh, to use your infantry to pin down the enemy infantry and typically what you want to do is uh, use counter units to pin down the enemy units so for example if they have a lot of uh, high attacking uh, swordsmen you can use something like pikemen because obviously these high attacking swordsmen might be able to do significant damage to your own swords unit however they will not be able to do anything against pike units as you can see over here they're being absolutely slaughtered uh, the second thing you can do, of course, as you've seen earlier in the battle, is, you know, kind of dedicate all of your cavalry units to quickly wipe out the enemy missile units uh, as fast as possible. Of course, uh, some of the cavalry units have been, you know, bogged down in the melee battle against melee units, and that's not ideal, which is why this cavalry unit has taken a little bit of damage. And then, of course, finally, you can position your archers or your missile units into a position to fire... Uh, you know crucial enemy units such as the missile cavalry that we dispatched off earlier and right now I'm actually trying to get my uh, Peltaste into a flanking position so that they can throw their javelins into the backs of these units so uh, That's a little bit of a uh, you know <coughs> a tip Meanwhile over here with the elephants since I do have access to elephant units I am just cycle charging throughout the enemy uh, entire enemy front line and 
the idea is to keep the elephants moving as much as possible because uh, they deal the most amount of damage on their initial charge. Of course, if you leave them in the melee, they're still going to do a lot of damage, but uh, you don't want your elephants to be bogged down because they're going to be, uh, you know, superior if you use them in cycle charges. So uh, the only reason you would keep your elephant units in a prolonged melee is if you believe that you can break this unit. Now this unit is still steady, so you know I am focusing on breaking away from it. Meanwhile, I am trying to hit uh, this cavalry unit because it seems to be the most dangerous unit right now, uh, trying to flank my own pikemen. So we get that beautiful charge off on the enemy cavalry and the enemy cavalry is not going to be able to do much against my elephant unit so they are going to be losing decisively and as you can see uh, since they lose decisively they will try to pull out which is going to make things even worse for them because uh, you know my elephants are going to give chase and going to inflict even more casualties so um, yeah meanwhile all the way in the back my cavalry is busy trying to you know extinguish the remnants of the enemy missile units uh, that's not going uh, too good, although we did start off at a very good uh, position. Uh, we haven't been all that quick, so our cavalry hasn't been able to do any decisive charges against the enemy front lines. Uh, meanwhile, our Peltasse over here have gotten into melee because they have exhausted all of their missiles. And uh, basically what I'm trying to do over here is try to pin some of the free units that are not engaged with our front lines so that our cavalry can make a comeback and start to perform some rear cycle charges against them. Meanwhile, our elephants are trying to get out of position and back into a charge over here. However, there is a little bit of a glitch going on over here. We have a couple of elephant units that are still engaged uh, with this enemy cavalry unit and that is rather dangerous. Meanwhile, our elephants managed to pull off another decisive charge against this unit and this is definitely going to break this unit because they are down to 50% strength and they are going to be losing men a lot quicker than they go. There you have it. You can see, meanwhile, this cavalry does manage to get a decent charge against the rear of my pikemen, to be honest. And, uh, you know, but they are already wavering. They don't have enough units. Uh, they're not that strong. We have dealt with them uh, significantly earlier. And, uh, you know, there's no major threat. Meanwhile, all of the fighting is happening pretty much on our left flank. And that is because our cavalry has been distracted for a long time, but they are making a comeback to the battle, of course. We have, uh, you know, our general over here. Um, and it's not really showing his name, but I believe it is our faction heir, uh, Antiochus II. So we're just trying to get into position and then we will begin our charge. Meanwhile, we are going to keep moving our elephants around to try to relieve the pressure of that left flank. Of course, our left flank is going to be significantly weaker because it, it consists of, uh, you know, our Usenoi units, which aren't all that great. And of course, it also consists of our Hoplites. Uh, although our Hoplites are doing really good, uh, you know, they are not going to be as good as pikemen in, uh, you know, dishing out some damage. So now at long last, our elephants have made that charge. Meanwhile, our cavalry is also charging, but we will not get to see that charge because for the most part, the entire enemy army is going to rout soon. And with that, we have achieved a decisive victory against the Kartli and we have a significant momentum advantage. Of course, I do continue the battle trying to get as many kills as possible. I'm not trying to wipe out the enemy army, mind you. I'm trying to allow them to survive so that I gain the momentum and I can push deeper into the enemy territory without freeing up a recruitment slot for the enemy. However, that being said and done, I'm going to go ahead and end the battle and I will see you all in the campaign. Alright, with that we have uh, acquired a crushing or decisive victory and uh, we are going to go ahead and capture all of the uh, captives and... Uh, with that, you know, we have gained a significant advantage. Uh, we will have the momentum advantage in the next turn. Alright guys, welcome to the next turn. And we have managed to acquire Sousa, which means our integration process of our satraps is well underway. However, we have a bit of bad news. We have actually lost a settlement. We have lost the settlement of Paratonian. And that is because, uh, you know, the army that was here in the Libyan desert could actually reach Paratonian, which is rather surprising since I did see their movement range and they could not do it. 
but thankfully I have an army right here nearby which I am going to use to attack the settlement. They have another army that's making its way towards Paratonian, so I will have to deal with that army as quickly as I possibly can. However, for now what we are going to do since they are sending their secondary army towards Paratonian, I can then march towards Kyrene, so that is exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, basically going to try to defeat Paratonian in this turn, uh, capture, recapture the settlement. Uh, hopefully this army should move towards me and uh, once they do that then I will be able to uh, you know take Kyrene without much fight and uh, thereby this army will be stranded and uh, you know will take a lot of attrition. Meanwhile let's have a quick look at the situation in the north our armies are completely replenished we can go ahead and you know attack this army we're gonna have a quick look to see if that would be necessary and for the most part, I don't think that's necessary because Koron is the only settlement that is kind of exposed. So what I want to do is I want to like very quickly push towards Phasus with Stratus 1 Seleucia. Go ahead, use my spy to get a line of sight of what's going on over here. We have several armies, in fact, over here uh, near Armavir. So, you know, in this uh, circumstance, what we want to do is uh, it's going to take a while for them to actually reach... Koron, so I could actually just, you know, uh, attack Tushpa, quickly acquire the province and move towards Armavir. Armavir is actually a very strategic uh, settlement as far as this, you know, this war is concerned. And the reason being is that it actually controls who can move in and out of Armenia. If I control uh, Armavir, then all of these armies will have to pass by Armavir in order to attack my own settlements. However, if I do attack Tushpa, then I leave kind of my northern regions undefended. So, yeah, so I think attacking Armavir will be the right play, which means we are most likely going to be attacked by a multitude of angry Armenians, and that could still push, uh, you know, the advantage or it could still push things in our favor. Unfortunately, we are not yet completely Hellenic, which means if I do attack Armavir, I will not be able to replenish in this turn. And I would ideally like to have a fully stacked out army in the defense of Armavir. So I might actually, you know what, it is really dicey. I really have to take Armavir. Um, and I am actually going to go ahead and do that because I don't have much time to deal with, uh, you know, the situation up here. And, I mean, they don't have a really a full stack that can pose a threat to us. However, uh, the combination of all of the armies is the close equivalent of a full stack. So they could technically, you know, go to Armavir and then it'll be a real struggle because not only do we have to fight essentially what is a full stack, but we will also have to, you know, fight the garrison of Armavir. So, you know, attacking Armavir right now, even though it is not Hellenic culture, is the play, in my opinion. So let's go ahead and do that eventually. Meanwhile, all the way in Antiochia, we have almost recruited our, uh, you know, army replacements. We want to get those four elephant units. So let's go ahead and get them. So we can get three at the moment, unless, of course, we cancel any of the uh, you know settlements or the buildings that are building in the settlements however before we go ahead and do that let's go ahead and upgrade our characters uh, we have uh, the governor general of Pessinus the eventual governor general of Pessinus and what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on that cultural conversion with this guy and you know what um, I should have actually been moving these guys into Armenia to help with that cultural conversion. However, I didn't really do that. So that is why I am kind of suffering in this turn. I could have had a completely Hellenized Hayesden or Armenia province. And that is exactly what I've been talking to you guys about. It's all about timing. And if you kind of like, you know, miss, mess up on the timing, then you're going to have a slight disadvantage in the future. Uh, let's have a very quick look at all of our settlements, see if we can upgrade any of the buildings. And of course we have Susa, which we have recently acquired. We're going to go ahead 
quickly dismantle the buildings over here. We want to maximize the cultural conversion of Sousa. And speaking about maximizing the cultural conversion of Sousa, let's go ahead and start sending a character down towards Sousa to help with that cultural conversion. Meanwhile, we have a dignitary over here that, can, that I can move towards Sousa to help further that cultural conversion. We have a spy in the area of uh, Nabata because we're keeping a close eyes out for the Mamlakat in Nabata. We eventually want to attack them once we have consolidated our position in Libya. So, yeah, apart from that, quick look at politics. We can go ahead and uh, this character over here is our new general who is busy recruiting in Stratos 5 Egyptos. He's a pretty good character because he has... You know, minus 15 upkeep cost for all land units. And if you couple that with military logistian, that gives an additional minus 15, then that's minus 30% upkeep for your entire army. So he's a really good character to have. However, as most of you guys know, I do not like to have, um, you know, I do not like to have uh, other political parties as army leaders. So I am going to use my political intrigue to entice him to join my party. And with that, we have he has successfully joined our cause, which is great. Uh, of course, he is not going to be an adopted character. So we are going to go ahead and try to adopt him. And we could adopt him, you know, with our faction leaders. So let's go ahead and adopt him if we can. Seems like we can't. Maybe we could. Hmm. Why is it that we can't adopt him? It's because we do not have enough authority. All right. Fair enough. Hmm. Adopting does cause... Hmm. We can... Oh, Alright, we need two authority more, so... We can adopt him with Apama the second. So let's go ahead and adopt him with Apama the second. We're not going to marry him off because he is an adopted character. going to give him some abilities. Um, maybe... There we go. Perfect. That being said and done, quick look at all of our other characters. If we can level up any of our characters, we can level up this guy. So let's go ahead and uh, promote him. Meanwhile, we don't have enough funds, um, unfortunately. So what we are going to do is we are going to go ahead and attack the settlement of Armavir. The auto result is not looking too good. However, it is a garrison fight. So I'm going to go ahead and fight this battle. I'll see you all after the battle is done. I'm not going to be showcasing this battle because it is a simple garrison fight. Alright, with that we have captured the settlement of Armavir. The good news is it is a foreign culture which means we can loot the settlement thereby gaining some treasury. So let's go ahead and loot the settlement. Uh, we're gonna go ahead repair all of the buildings, dismantle the buildings we do not require. And we can leave this and in fact just convert it into an outpost. And in the next turn we should have Hellenic as the dominant culture over there. Which means I could afford to actually move this dignitary towards Tushpa. Gain a line of sight of what's going on over there. Tushpa does have a pretty significant garrison, 17 men. I was kind of hoping that this army over here could kind of, uh, you know, attack Tushpa. Um, but that seems very, very unlikely. Uh, instead, what I will be having to do is, you know, basically having to wrap up the situation over here, try to pincer Mishkera, and then, you know, I will be able to deal with Tushpa. That being said and done, the last remaining thing that we have to do is, in fact, attack Paratonian for, you know, taking it out from underneath us. Um, the auto results is looking pretty bad. 35% is horrible, which means we will end up even losing some units so we are going to go ahead and fight this it's going to be an interesting battle uh, nothing too significant because they have a garrison that's not fully replenished they do have an army a full 20 stack of pretty decent units in my opinion but for the most part since they have just recently conquered paratonian they are a little bit depleted which means uh, of course i have the advantage but however that being said and done we're gonna have to fight this battle so let's go ahead quick save hop into the battle and i will see you all in the battle Alright, so we are having the reconquest against uh, the Kyrenaike for Paratonian. And we have arranged our troops in our typical formation with the pikemen in the center. They are flanked by our hoplite units. Really beautiful uh, looking with that uh, sub mod from Izuru Alexander, of course. We have our Efigration Peltaste and our Usenoi troops protecting the flank. Meanwhile, in the rear, we have our Cretan archers, and on either flanks, we have our. Indian elephants and of course our Hippeus Agamatos in the in the rear. So what we are going to try to do is we are going to try to engage the enemy over here. 
and I'm just gonna slightly fast forward so that we can get into our position really quickly and initiate the battle. Uh, ideally I would have preferred if the enemy sallied forth to attack me but it doesn't seem like they will so this battle will be a little bit drawn out and uh, basically we will have to push into uh, you know the enemies that are defending the settlement so that is not the ideal scenario of course you want uh, your own troops to be you know well positioned and allow the enemy to attack you uh, however in this case i will have to attack the enemies myself and as you can see it's uh, a significant problem because you know they're not attacking me but they are you know unleashing a lot of missiles into my units i've already taken some casualties and so i have decided that i am going to push my units and try as much as possible to engage the enemy units uh, meanwhile i've realized that since i am going to be attacking them in this narrow corridor there's no need for support troops on my flank so i'm moving all of my support troops to uh, you know counter flank the enemy units i'm starting to move uh, you know my cavalry also into a position uh, to counter attack the enemy meanwhile i am prioritizing my archer fire into the enemy pike units because the kairu Neke actually have a lot of pikemen and uh, their pikemen can they're not as good as our bronze shield pikemen but they can dish out some serious damage to our bronze shield pikemen so it's pretty much just an exchange of missile fires they're trying to weaken my pike formation meanwhile i'm trying to weaken their pike formation of course i have Christian archers so i do have the advantage i am able to kill a lot faster uh, even though these units are actually javelin units so that being said and done let's have a quick look at what's going on in the other sections of the battle uh, another good thing about these units right here and why i love them so much is that they do have a lot of missiles so they are really versatile so what i can use them for is actually uh, you know unleash my missiles on you know important units like enemy pikemen and then use them in a melee against you know weaker levy tiered uh, you know javelin men and so forth so they will be able to be at an advantage in both circumstances so that is definitely something you want to watch out for meanwhile my general and my elephants over here not doing much because i'm actually keenly watching the situation over here they do have a lot of missile units over here but they are kind of protected by some melee units uh, I eventually realized that this uh, hoplite unit is actually is significantly weakened so I eventually decide to you know issue an order for my elephants to just wipe them out so that I can uh, you know begin my offensive over here. Meanwhile over here as you can see my uh, my versatile support troops are basically uh, you know just kiting the enemy just harassing them over here on their right flank and uh, that's pretty much the idea i want them to be uh, harassed i want them to keep moving around and uh, buy enough time to you know uh, significantly weaken their more elite units like their pike units over here and as you can see they have sent a completely fresh unit of pikemen and so once again i'm going to try to weaken them with these units and uh, i will showcase that shortly meanwhile over here on the left flank you can see that uh, you know my left flank of cavalry is also not doing much I'm just basically trying to figure out what is the best way to go about attacking this enemy formation which is quite uh, you know there's no real clear-cut rock paper scissors going on over here it's pretty evenly matched the AI has actually done quite a good job in uh, you know positioning its troops it's not making it easy for me to break down uh, their defense which is why I decided to showcase this battle because this is pretty much one of the harder battles you will ever have to face when it comes to dealing with the enemy AI. However as you can see some of my pikemen starting to take a little bit of damage because of those missile units meanwhile my own Cretan archers have exhausted all of the ammunition so they're not going to be uh, you know that powerful and there you have it right over there on the right flank you can see my elephants have finally decided uh, you know to charge at the enemy uh, there's not much going on over here you have a unit of light melee uh, townsfolk they are not going to be able to defend these missile units and of course you have a hoplite unit which is quite good against cavalry however they are only 30 out of uh, 200 meanwhile we are going to continue to harass these pikemen going to keep throwing our javelins into their flanks trying to weaken them of course keep in mind you might not get a lot of kills uh, but you are significantly reducing their HP and if they kind of turn in a very you know bad position like this you will see a lot of kills coming in so there you have it as you can see we are now slowly 
shredding this unit. I wouldn't exactly say sh shredding, to be honest, because, uh, you know, we are not entirely decimating them. And now they're facing us, which I don't really care, as long as they're not attacking us head on. Uh, that's fine. And even if they decide to attack us head on, I, I have a lot more, uh, you know, maneuverability. These are extremely light troops, so I can easily pull out of the engagement. I don't have to commit these troops into the fighting. Oh, <laughs> I think I still delay over here with our elephants. I don't know why it's actually a uh, pretty big mistake because I can really get a breakthrough over here earlier on. But uh, I guess that's just how the game is. I mean, uh, you make some good moves and of course you make some bad moves. But the good thing about uh, showcasing these replays is that I can even show you some of my mistakes. A lot of you think that I am this impeccable player but I tend to make uh, you know some mistakes of course they're not very costly mistakes I don't make blunders but yes 100% I do make mistakes from time to time and the major mistake over here is that I'm not using these units for the most majority of the battle they are being r rather idle now we have our other units of uh, you know support troops and basically what they're doing is they're continuing to harass the enemy pike formations uh, trying to whittle them down as much as possible. Eventually I decide to push up my pikemen a little bit forward, try to get these units engaged so that they have their weaker side facing towards me. Uh, unfortunately a lot of their pikemen are still just wandering about over here. They're not doing much really to be honest. Uh, they're just sitting there and eating all that missile damage so hey I'm not complaining much but I would much rather have them engage my pike units so that I can get done and dusted with this battle as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, over here in the far left or in the far rear of the enemy units, as you can see, they have a pretty formidable formation over here. So I can't really use my left wing of cavalry to, you know, kind of disperse these units. Because if I could do that, then I will have another significant advantage. I could charge into the rear of the units that are currently engaged with my own units. However, <laughs> you know, they are being really smart, the AI, in this battle, which is nice to see. And I kind of wish that the AI played a little bit more like this every time. However, uh, they don't seem to be doing that. Of course, eventually, uh, you know, when it does come to quality, I am simply going to outclass the AI because I have better units, better troops. But as you can see, it's not an easy battle. Most of our settlement battles are super easy. We managed to wrap them off in about five minutes. However, this battle goes on for 25 minutes because, uh, you know, just these um, positioning of the AI is uh, so good in this battle. Uh, however, this also kind of shows you guys the importance of positioning your troops and uh, you should definitely take a few lessons from the AI over here. I could be a little bit more proactive with my own infantry trying to keep pushing in, trying to keep luring in more enemy units that are kind of protecting over here. And right now I'm like enough is enough. I'm trying to get my elephants around and trying to break these guys so that I can move up my infantry. Uh, the idea over here is that, you know, I want to be able to move up my infantry in unison. I want them to move together. And now that I finally commit my elephants into the fight, we see a cavalry unit that's trying to countercharge my elephant units. They shouldn't be able to do much against an elephant unit. And in fact, if they get into my pike units, it's going to be rather disastrous for them. So I'm not too concerned about that. But what I am trying to do is slowly break away at this enemy. Uh, you know formation over here Meanwhile still the same blunder going on on the right flank or rather mistake. It's not really a blunder uh, In my definition, I would say a blunder is something that will cost you the battle But a mistake is something that will make the battle less efficient So definitely not fighting this is one of the rare instances in which I'm not fighting the battle to my uh, you know fullest uh, capabilities however to be fair, the AI is really playing this well. They're really drawing out this battle. And of course, if we were playing on a timer, then I probably would have lost. But I don't think, uh, you know, a timer is anything that should be. I mean, if you guys are using it, then, I mean, go ahead and use it. But I personally, I like to keep the timer unlimited. Uh, as I don't really think that, you know, time is really important in a battle. As long as a general understands that, you know, he is going to eventually win the battle. He won't really care for how long the battle p goes on for, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. And uh, I think, hopefully, <laughs> I kind of wake up over here on the right flank and decide, you know what, 
And there you have it. Yeah, okay, I have finally woken up. Praise be uh, Zeus, I guess. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we are going to get a breakthrough over here eventually on this flank. And uh, keep in mind, I do notice that there's this hoplite unit still. So I am not too eager to send my cavalry, especially my general, uh, into the fray. I am trying to get rid of this hoplite unit as quickly as I can. And once I get rid of them, then I'm going to you know, follow up that elephant charge with the charge from my cavalry. <clears throat> Meanwhile, over here... I am going to slowly try to break this formation because I kind of had enough. I think I eventually, uh, you know, use these units to kind of disrupt the enemy formations over here and then use my cavalry to kind of break this enemy formations because I realized that the fighting in the center isn't going to change much. I am trying to push my infantry up as you can see over here, They're slowly marching into position. We're going to create like a kind of encirclement or semi-encirclement of the enemy. Uh, and we're trying to go, try to force them to get into an engagement because as you can see the pikemen are still you know doing a military parade in front of our own pikemen and that is just how the AI works in Rome 2 Total War unfortunately so you, you have the good with the bad obviously this is a good situation of AI management and of course this is absolutely horrible but it is kind of favoring them because it's actually prolonging the battle much longer than needs be with well, that being said and done, we have almost wiped out the units over here. I realize that, you know, my elephants have lost momentum. So that's the importance, guys. You want to keep moving your elephant units. You want to keep the momentum up and running. And, uh, you know, I am also going to keep the pressure on this missile units. I have issued orders for my cavalry to charge. We've gotten rid of all of the, uh, you know, potential threats to my own cavalry. So, you know, a charge over here shouldn't be, uh, you know, too risky. They have just some archer units over here and they don't have any anti-cavalry capabilities as you can see. They don't have any spears so my cavalry will be quite uh, powerful over here on the charge. And as you can see, managed to get a pretty decent charge against these guys. However, the pathfinding once again, uh, you know, kind of puts me in a bad spot. But regardless, cavalry is definitely going to be at an advantage over here. Now, eventually I do try to cycle in my elephants to get another charge to break over there. Meanwhile, over here, we are trying to slowly clean up all of these routing units. We're trying to force the enemy AI to kind of uh, respond to our movements, get them into a bad position, and then try to attack them. And for now, what I'm mainly focused on is just, you know, wiping out all of these units that are in full retreat and uh, making sure that they don't return back to the battle because the battle as it is is quite long enough it's longer than it needs be uh, so definitely i'm trying my level best to quickly end the battle i like my battles to be you know fast and decisive uh, and that's pretty much what you guys should also aim to be doing in your battles you don't want a long drawn out battle like this uh, however you know as far as our casualties and everything is concerned we're not doing too bad we have most of our units still pretty, uh, you know, pretty much at full strength with the exception, of course, of our Phalanx guides because they have been in the battle for the longest periods of time. But even they, they have not taken significant amount of damage. They're still, for the most part, at least 70 to 80 percent full strength. Uh, however, over here, you can see our cavalry is continuing to try to attack and break over here. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of counter cavalry units over here so I have to be really careful with my cavalry and I am trying to be as careful as I possibly can against my cavalry with my cavalry so I try to pull them out before they start taking some significant casualties and now even though the spike unit did reach my cavalry they decide to back off which is uh, rather surprising it's allowing me to kind of you know attack this archer unit which seems to be winning against my cavalry strangely enough meanwhile over here we've uh, had a successful attack against the enemy uh, you know positions over here and now I realize that there's a, a much bigger opening but they do have some you know phalanx units intermixed between these archer units which is once again creating a little bit of a problem with you know my uh, my avenue of attack rather so I can't really just go in there guns blazing I have to be really careful about it uh, since I do want to preserve a lot of the units of course if you don't really care about casualties you can just go in there guns blazing uh, an elephant and 
two full Hippes Agamentos should be able to wipe out this entire blob. They will take some casualties, especially if this unit decides to join the fight. Uh, but they will eventually win because they don't have a lot of units over here. But again, I don't like taking a lot of casualties. The reason being is I want to maintain that momentum in the campaign. So you have to realize the battle is not everything in Divide et Impera. Of course, there's a campaign that you have to follow up with. And if you have taken a lot of casualties, then you'll have to wait a lot of turns to replenish and keep that momentum uh, you know, going. Unless, of course, you decide to consolidate units get some mercenary units to you know fill in the deficiencies however that is once again not the most efficient way of playing because not only do you have to spend a lot of money for it you have to spend a lot of upkeep you are eventually going to disband those units and go back to your regular army composition and in my opinion that's not uh, you know obviously not the optimal way to play so you might as well have a longer battle uh, and preserve your units rather than try to rush things and take up a lot of casualties. So once again, we have our elephants over here charging into a hoplite unit and do not be afraid to charge into hoplites with your elephants. As you can see, I haven't taken any casualties. I'm winning decisively. These are light hoplites. Uh, they are fairly weak to add to it. And in fact, uh, you know, ironically, their weakness is actually their strength because if they had more units, they would have routed a lot faster. And you might be asking, how is that? And that is because our elephants will be dealing a lot more casualties, a lot more quicker, and that actually impacts morale quite significantly. However, when they have fewer units, our elephant pathfinding is a lot harder because our elephant units are actually pretty massive. So you have like just one or two elephants uh, struggling to, to attack 30 men. And, uh, you know, the other 10 elephants or so are just like wandering about. Meanwhile, charging elephants into a blob like this is a lot more impactful. You can uh, deal out a lot of casualties, but again, once again over here, you have really small units, so they're not going to be taking a lot of casualties. Of course, over here, I've decided to just charge in my general because I've had enough of what's going on. I want to end this battle as quickly as possible. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, it is still taking time. We have three and a half minutes actually left for this battle, so I don't really care. I'm just trying to... Uh, you know speed things up and trying to get some sort of uh, you know trying to use my right and left flank to kind of help each other now so I realize on my left flank I have a lot of melee units uh, and they do have a lot of anti uh, cavalry units so I'm going to try to pin down these units over here eventually and then I'm going to use my right flank cavalry to charge into the left flank so that will eventually happen. Meanwhile, I try to pull my elephants out because once again, you don't want to keep your elephants bogged in a fight for too long. I do notice that they send one of their fuller phalangite into the fights. So definitely don't want your elephants to be there or stick around for that. Meanwhile, as you can see, yes, I have you know, decided to commit my melee units just to hold down these units. Uh, of course, Yuzunoi and, uh, you know, uh, Efficreation... Uh, you know, Peltas, they are not going to be able to win against Phalangite, of course. But the idea over here is to make them commit to fighting me. And the reason being is that I'm going to charge my elephants. I'm going to charge into their rears and uh, basically get that exposed flank that I so long desperately need for that to happen. Meanwhile, I have used my elephants to charge over here. So I'm making some headway into the main front line, uh, which is always great. But then I eventually have to pull out and start attacking over here because my uh, Yuzunoi as well as, of course, my... Uh, oh, so it's two Yuzunoi units over here. That's fine. It's still the same concept because they are both light units. They won't be able to fight Phalangite quite effectively. But, uh, you know, funnily enough, this Phalangite is losing decisively. So I guess that's great news. Meanwhile, we're keeping our elephants moving. Uh, we don't want to take casualties. They do have a... A complete unit of phalange day over here so I'm gonna try to you know charge into this unit it's probably not the best idea but uh, you know as long as they're not kind of deployed I, it is safe for me to do so and it seems like they're not really deployed so I decide to give a charge uh, try to attack them and of course I don't take a lot of casualties from this charge because they are really out of position meanwhile I kind of see that it's time to begin our rear charges against these units uh, for the most part, I don't realize this cavalry coming back into the fighting, which is uh, kind of funny. There are a lot of things I do wrong in this battle, but, uh, you know, there's just about a minute left to this battle, to be honest. And it's just like, 
grinding these last few units into submission. That's pretty much what it is. We have another elephant unit that's going to make a side charge over here and they actually don't end up doing it because of the pathfinding with the smaller unit. So as you can see, smaller units can be a little bit of a nuisance against elephant units. So you definitely want to charge your elephant into blobs. And uh, you can see over here the front line is in collapse. Not a complete collapse, however. And uh, unfortunately that means the battle is going to last a li little bit longer than necessary. But of course the enemy is losing a lot of units. So uh, soon enough they will go into a complete route because they will not have the relative strength to our army. And that is a huge morale debuff. So as you can see over here, we have that complete route. We have managed to win the battle. It's a long battle, but still a decisive victory. Because if you take a look at our casualties, it is significantly low. However, that being said and done, I am going to go ahead and end this battle and I will see you all back in the campaign. Alright, with that we have managed to wipe out the army in Peritonian. We managed to recapture the settlement and we've got to peacefully occupy it because it is Hellenic culture. So we get a little bit of replenishment in this turn. I'm going to go ahead and build up the buildings over there. Um, that being said and done, we are ready to go ahead and end the turn. Before we do that, however, we want to keep engaging in our diplomacy and uh, we're going to keep uh, uh, engaging with, uh, let's say, the Parthavans. We want to get a province from the Parthavans in the province of Parthia so that we can then start to peacefully integrate Parthia as well. Right now, we're pretty happy with Parsa because we have a single settlement in Parsa, namely Susa. We are going to try to con culturally convert Susa uh, from a Persian culture, which will take quite a while, into Hellenic. As you can see, our influence change is absolutely zero. So we really need to move our characters into the province. And then eventually, uh, we will have to convert it using our dignitaries as well. So... Uh, that being said and done, we're almost done culturally converting over here, so I don't really need the dignitaries over here anymore. What I could do is actually send the dignitaries down towards uh, Parthia as well as Parsa. Uh, apart from that, I don't think there's much else left to do in this turn. We are in the process of moving towards Kyrene, and hopefully we will get there before this army kind of tries to, you know, engage us. But for the most part, even if it does engage us... Uh, we are in a decent position to fend off the attack. It's only a 16 stack. Meanwhile, even though we are not, uh, you know, even though we are full stack, we do have some taken some quite some casualties in that previous battle, uh, around 600 losses. But we are able to replenish in a single turn, and that is because of the abilities we have selected for our general, uh, maximizing that military conscriptor as well as uh, you know being garrisoned within the settlement is improving our. Um, replenishment rate however if they do not attack us in this turn we will have a significant advantage but for the most part as far as i can tell they will most certainly attack us in this turn uh, since we have a little bit of money we can get that final unit of uh, you know syrian war elephants and eventually we will be able to link up with the armies in the east and transfer over those units all right welcome to the next turn <clears throat> Let's go ahead and upgrade some of our characters. So we have the Governor General or the Governor Admiral of uh, Ephesos. Let's go ahead and give him some abilities to improve his taxation rate. Focus on that empire maintenance, please. And apart from that, we even have another character over here that we can focus on the empire maintenance, increasing our economy a significant amount. Uh, you want to select traits like this that give a boost to your tax rate. And for the other traits, you can select something that improves your public order. And uh, meanwhile, what's happened over here is that this army has moved into the Libyan desert. So I really need a line of sight on him. Um, he can technically approach Kyrene. Uh, however, I don't think he should be able to. Instead, what I could do is I could attack Kyrene. I could attack this army that's outside Kyrene. And uh, thereby, I will get the entire garrison to fight in the open, which will be a significant advantage. Meanwhile, over here, what I want to do is I want to sabotage this army. Unfortunately, as always, uh, you know, my spy has died or gotten wounded. You know, I'm really having some bad RNG with this uh, campaign. However, for the most part, let's go ahead and attack this army. You know what, it's a pretty decent auto-resolve, so I could just simply auto-resolve this one. 72%, uh, I'm not too unhappy with that. Let's go ahead and just auto-resolve that one, which means the conquest of Kyrene is going to be even easier. And uh, we're going to be able to 
complete our consolidation of <coughs> of Libya. Let's go ahead, attack Kyrie. Now we should have an even better auto resolve. We might end up actually losing a few units over here. And uh, wow, that is really close. But we can peacefully occupy the settlement. It is Hellenic culture and it belonged always to a Hellenic faction. So they should have a pretty significant amount of troops. Uh, meanwhile, this army over here is uh, unable to reach any of the settlements. Uh, so they will be taking quite a significant bit of attrition over there. Uh, for the most part, I think they might be trying to move towards Ammonium, if not Ojilla. Uh, just going to have a quick look at both of these settlements. Ojilla is uh, relatively weak, but that should be resolved if we are able to get that level 2 settlement as quickly as possible. Uh, meanwhile, Ammonium is pretty decent with 13 uh, you know, units in the garrison and for the most part Ammonium is very easy to reinforce with the army over here. Meanwhile, in Peritonian, we do not have any more population class so actually let's move our army into Ammonium so that they can continue to replenish in this turn. Uh, that being said and done, we want to go ahead and uh, repurpose all the buildings over here. We're going to get... Of course, um, you know, the sanitation building to improve our growth rate per turn. And over here, we can actually go ahead and start to build a natural philosophy center. We can even leave, uh, you know, the Odeon or the amphitheater, as I like to call it, um, because it does improve our second class population, which is the most important population class when the Seleucids are concerned. That being said, we even have a spy that is uh, kind of upgraded over here. So let's go ahead and level him up give him some abilities that will improve his chances to I mainly focus on assassination as well as sabotage as I consider these two to be the most important abilities meanwhile all the way down in Susa we're just going to build a lot of temples to help with our cultural conversion we do not have any Hellenic cultural influence however that will quickly change once we have our character within the settlement as this character over here does have you know quite a lot of cultural conversion available to him meanwhile we are going to take a quick look at our diplomacy uh, or rather our politics as you can see most of our political parties are extremely loyal so we don't really have to worry too much about our politics but we are in the process of trying to reduce our influence we're right now really close to reducing our influence let's go ahead and send this character to try to acquire a province from Pathava once again Meanwhile, the other character can go ahead and try to improve the public order in some province. We're going to focus on Bithynia at Pontus. And uh, apart from that, we can send yet another character to acquire some food. And we can acquire some food in Mesopotamia. So we're looking quite good. Of course, our economy, as you can tell, is pretty weak. It's not too powerful. But uh, keep in mind, we do have a lot of Silver Shield pikemen and very elite elephants. And they are costing almost a thousand denarii per elephant to maintain so um, once we transfer them off to our generals who can afford cheap armies then that should make things a lot easier meanwhile over here the situation is very interesting the Kartli really haven't uh, you know done anything to change the status quo in the area so things are looking just a little bit uh, you know up for grabs I don't really know what to do over here of course I could attack Fasus that is pretty much very obvious uh, we have a 79% chance so let's just go ahead auto resolve that one we're gonna go ahead and loot the settlement of course we're gonna deploy in the port so that we can get that replenishment rate within this turn and uh, pretty much most of these armies okay actually none of these armies can reach Fasus turn off the taxation rate at Fasus go ahead repair all of the buildings dismantle all of the other buildings that we do not need and with that we have managed to gain a foothold in the Caucasus uh, which kind of relieves the pressure on some of our Hellenic compatriots up here in the north uh, hopefully uh, you know the Bosphorans will deal with the Colchis faction however that being said and done we might be still able to pincer uh, the Kartli in the coming turns. My real concern is actually how we're going to deal with the problem of Tushpa over here. Uh, maybe we could try in the next turn to kind of auto resolve the battle at Tushpa and I think we should be able to. Uh, so what I'm going to do is in the next turn I am 
you know what, actually in this turn I'm gonna hire some mercenary cavalry so that the enemy AI cannot recruit it for themselves. And the next turn I'm gonna attack Tushpa, I should be able to replenish at Tushpa. And then I'm gonna march up northwards towards Armavir and uh, kind of reorganize my armies, get rid of all these mercenaries and uh, basically keep my momentum going uh, without having to worry about this enemy settlement that is, uh, you know, behind my offensive. Uh, that being said, now let's have a very quick look at all of our buildings. We can go ahead and upgrade these buildings, but for now I'm trying to keep at least some uh, of the denarii in reserve because I might need that in the, in an emergency situation. Meanwhile, this army could potentially move towards Ojila. I, I reckon it will take them about two turns to get to Ojila, uh, and that's going to be about the same amount of time that I will need to get towards Ojila. So I could potentially deploy in the port so that I get some extra movement range. However, uh, my replenishment is not looking too good, so I am going to stay within the settlement. Of course, it's a it's a massive gamble, uh, but what I can do is I could move towards Ojila. And that means, you know, I am just as close to reinforcing Ojila as I am towards Ammonium as well as Peritonian. So that should mean that I will not have much of a problem dealing with this army. Unfortunately, if I did have a spy over here, I would be able to assassinate this character. Our spy in Nabata is quite far off, so uh, there's nothing much we can do about that. That being said, done, I think I am done for this turn. What I could do is I could engage in some, you know, political actions that will improve uh, you know, the stats of my female characters, which I desperately need. Uh, we can go ahead, uh, see if we can educate any of our characters. We can educate some of our sons, so let's go ahead, educate them. Meanwhile, we can send Apama on a vacation to get that final level of cunning, so she should be 11, 10, 10 in the next turn. Uh, as far as authority is concerned, we have some characters that lack in authority, some characters that lack in zeal. So let's go ahead and give them that zeal as well as give an authority as well to Stratonike. Uh, so that bumps her up to 858, which means in a couple of turns we should be able to get her to 10510 10, or even more if we are going to send her on a vacation. And we should actually focus on sending Stratonike on a vacation because that will actually promote her. Meanwhile, a quick look at some of our other female characters. We have another female character over here. We can send her on a diplomatic mission. I could send her to Asagata. Uh, that will level her up. She might not be all that much successful because she has really low gravitas, but uh, you know, that's a very easy way of upgrading that character. That being said and done, let's go ahead, end the turn, and I will see you all in the next turn. All right, welcome to the next turn. We have a wounded character because one of our diplomacy was not successful, unfortunately. However, that's not too concerning. What we are going to do is we're going to keep moving towards, uh, you know, Parthia, try to acquire some of the settlements from uh, Parthava. Meanwhile, we are going to start moving this character down towards Raga because eventually he will have to convert Parthava in order to increase our chance of acquiring some of the provinces using the Timbe trade regions of mod. We are moving our other character towards Susa to help with the cultural conversion. And for now, you can see we have begun culturally converting the province. Persian culture is on the decline. Meanwhile, Hellenic culture is going to increase. However, uh, as far as influence is concerned, we only have seven Hellenic influence versus 18 Persian influence. So it's going to be very tough to culturally convert uh, Parsa to Hellenic. However, we are going to be sending our dignitaries across in an attempt to culturally convert that province as quickly as we possibly can. That being said, done. let's have a quick look at all of our buildings. Um, for the most part, I'm pretty happy with my buildings. I'm not too concerned with building stuff right now unless I have to, like in the case of this area over here. Since, of course, um, you know, I will get slumps if I do not focus on that. Meanwhile, our general over here is replenishing, so I'm happy to leave him into that port. Uh, speaking of, you know, which I could push my offensive towards Tushpa. Meanwhile, uh, you know, the Kartli uh, beginning to raid my lands. Uh, this army is kind of fully replenished. I could go ahead and attack this raiding army, uh, but what that's going to do is it's going to push him right back towards Mishkera. And I don't want to actually do that. Instead, what I am going to do is I'm going to attack this army. Make sure I wipe him out. It's going to be an easy auto-resolve. Go ahead, auto-resolve that. Get him out of the equation. Go ahead and re 
redeploy in Armavir should be able to replenish in this turn I imagine and uh, yeah apart from that a quick look at what's going on in Libya we have of course the Kyrene making a way um, back towards uh, their capital unfortunately they will not be able to do much uh, instead what we are going to do is we're completely going to ignore them we're going to move towards Paratonia and start moving our armies eastwards and we are going to focus on Petra which is going to be our next target uh, basically the war in Arabia is uh, the Mamelkat and Nabata and the Badevi they are in an alliance with each other they're fighting against the uh, Mamelkat and Sabata who's at war with the entirety of the Arabian Peninsula so I don't see them surviving for much longer Meanwhile, the Ethiopians are still at war with the Mamelkat and Nabata, so I could step in and get some uh, really crucial victories over here. Capture Petra, which is a very significant, the only wall settlement that I really am interested in conquering. And uh, once I conquer that, I'm going to release a satrapy from that region, and then I'm going to feed him some of these other Arabian settlements, and thereby eventually slowly wipe out the Mamelkat and Nabata, as well as the Badevi, uh, thereby securing my southern Arabian frontier. Uh, that being said, now let's have a very quick look at our politics. We have a political intrigue that requires our attention. Rumors of an old blacksmith who lives in the depth of forest, finest spearhead. So let's go ahead and just buy something. <clears throat> Hopefully that will give us some military buffs. Meanwhile, as far as politics is concerned, let's go ahead and uh, educate some of the characters. Um, so we have educated two of these characters. This is the third child, so there will be a decent amount of time before she comes of age. Uh, basically what we can do is educate that character because she is the second born, which means uh, she's more likely to be older. And uh, as you can see, I was wrong, but it's a pretty good bet. And if you don't want to waste time checking out the character ages, this is a method I use. I basically look at the first spawn. If the first spawn has come of age, then I focus on ob obviously the second spawn. However, I kind of prioritize uh, based on, uh, you know, the uh, chronology of the birth of the character. So I will always try to improve my second spawn kids. Uh, before I go ahead and upgrade the third born kids because I could potentially uh, send Berenike on a tutoring but it doesn't make sense because 2C D-Days could come of age before that so the priority is 2C D-Days and in a similar fashion even though Alexandra might be older than 2C D-Days um, um, you know I will go ahead and upgrade 2C D-Days because I I kind of have an indicator here if Alexandra is close to coming of age. That being said, down we can also engage in some, uh, you know, some abilities to improve the attributes of our character. So we have gone ahead and upgraded the authority of Laodike. Meanwhile, we can also upgrade uh, the zeal of Stratonike. And now we can start sending. Uh, some of our other characters to improve their cunning. We're going to begin with Stratonike because not only does she improve her cunning, she improves her, her rank. Meanwhile, Lygia as well as Laodike are already at that maximum rank. That being said and done, let's send some of our characters to improve the public order and we're going to begin with improving the public order in the Caucasus. Uh, apart from that, we have some other characters. We don't have a lot of money, unfortunately. Uh, but can we send any of our characters on a diplomatic mission? And we're going to try to send them on a diplomatic mission with Pathava. And we seem to keep failing in our diplomatic missions with Pathava, which means that will reduce the opinion of us. However, I'm not too concerned because, you know, once my economy is up and running, I will be able to have a lot of money to improve their relationships. And in about three, uh, six turns, I will have upgraded these buildings in Egyptos, which will help my economy quite significantly. That being said and done, I don't think there's much else left to do in this turn. So what we're going to go is we're going to go ahead, end the turn, and uh, pretty much we'll see you all in the next turn. All right, welcome to the next turn. We have succeeded in a diplomacy. We have acquired the province of Sardarkarta. Meanwhile, our Thurius reforms have also triggered, which is great news. So we're going to keep moving our dignitary into the province of uh, you know, Pathia over here. We're going to go ahead and turn off the taxation over here. And we're going to use Pathava as a province to recruit our cavalry units because Pathava has access to the horse, war horse resource, which makes it ideal for, you know, recruiting cavalry. Unfortunately, we need that resource of war horses in order to, you know, recruit or to build up. So we're just going to try our level best to, you know, establish a trade agreement with the Parthians. We're going to pay them, in fact. 
and they're going to reject it. So we're going to pay them a, quite a hefty fee. And if they do not accept it eventually, I'm going to go ahead and I'll try to attack them. They're as weak as can possibly be. However, they have accepted it, which is great. So we can go ahead and form this into a building that, uh, you know, improves our uh, cavalry recruitment. So basically at the limited warhorse breeding, we get plus eight cavalry charge bonus upon recruitment. And if we stack that up in our entire province, then we can pretty much uh, have insane cavalry. That being said and done, let's keep moving our dignitaries down south. Uh, we're gonna move them towards here. Meanwhile, our character is close. Oops, almost <laughs> kind of declared war on my own satrapy. What we want to do is move towards Hecatomb Pylos or even Salvacata so that we, uh, you know, maximize the cultural conversion. We have 11 influence right now. Uh, meanwhile, Parani culture has 13 influence, so we are almost the dominant influence in the region. Meanwhile, let's go ahead and deploy in Susa. Uh, quick look at the cultural influence in Susa. We're still on the back foot over there. Uh, however, that will change once we are able to get our dignitary into the province of Susa. So let's go ahead and keep moving our dignitary. Meanwhile, we have, uh, you know, very depleted army of the Kyrene uh, that's making a move towards Kyrene. Uh, thankfully, I will be able to easily dispatch them. If I, in fact, attack them, they will move deeper into the desert. Kind of wastes a turn. However, I don't want to chase them into the desert. I don't want to take attrition. I'm just going to pop back into the settlement, uh, basically allow them to get a little bit more of an attrition tick and once that's done then I will be able to, you know, just completely ignore that army. Uh, the good news is our spy has been, you know, has kind of reappeared, respawned, so we could even potentially even assassinate the character, so unfortunately we can't reach the character in this turn, so uh, we're gonna have to wait another turn before we go ahead and attack that character. Meanwhile, we can move a Stratus to Mesopotamia all the way to the east. We can upgrade some of our troops, so let's go ahead and... Ooh, am I in the marshlands? I guess I am. Well, unfortunately. Let's go ahead and upgrade uh, these guys into Turia Swordsman. Uh, we can even upgrade these guys into Peltaste. Now, I don't like Peltaste in comparison to, uh, you know, uh, Ificration Peltas, and that is because Ificration Peltas are really good against cavalry units. Meanwhile, Peltaste are more of a versatile melee unit. Uh, so, definitely, uh, in my opinion, my personal opinion, I prefer the Ificrations. However, uh, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. We just basically have to, have to kind of try to upgrade them regardless and I might actually even get rid of these units entirely in the army however having a couple of javelin units is always useful because if you're up against elephants then as you have seen in our previous battles uh, you know javelins can come in quite clutch that being said and done I could potentially attack Mishketa uh, they do have a, quite a sizable garrison they have they actually have quite a lot going on for them so I could potentially attack them but I'm just going to wait a couple of turns until this army completely replenishes and then I'm going to go ahead and attack them. Meanwhile over here if I attack this army I have a feeling it will kind of retreat back towards Mesqueda. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to try to attack it from a different direction. There we go. And now it retreats in a unfavorable direction. I can't go ahead and simply auto resolve this because this would mean that I would wipe out the army. So let's just go ahead and wipe out that army. Uh, we will take some significant casualties. We can go ahead and slave all of the captives. Uh, but we can move back towards Armavir. And now we have a, quite a significant advantage. Because if we are able to replenish in this turn, then pretty much in the next turn, we will be able to attack Mishkeda. Uh, that Speaking about attacking, we can go ahead and attack Tushpa. Pretty bad auto-resolve, but I am going to go ahead and auto-resolve this. Uh, hopefully I don't lose any units. I've lost a couple of Silver Shield pikemen. Unfortunate that. Uh, however, I haven't lost uh, too much, so we can go ahead and just disband all of our mercenaries. We have consolidated our hold in the province of Armenia, so we don't really have to worry about the enemy in our rear. Instead, what we can do is we can just keep moving this army across back towards Syria in order to, you know, re-recruit some Silver Shield pikemen. And I believe I lost about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7... 
Seven. I lost three Silver Shield Pikemen, so... Yeah, that is rather unfortunate. Meanwhile, over here, I could go ahead and build up that research building. So I'm going to leave that as it is for now. Uh, instead, what I am going to do is just convert this building into, uh, you know, a third... Tier 3 settlements and with tier 3 settlements you have three options. You have of course the fortified option which gives you your maximum benefit to your population classes which is important to build in your recruitment provinces. Uh, with the center which is your metropolitan uh, you know, variant you get research rate which is the most important modifier in my opinion. Uh, when it comes to this particular variant and in the final one you get the maximum commercial benefit. So uh, Really, when you're specializing your provinces, you basically want to build the right chain, depending on the province. And since, of course, Hairston is going to be a research-based uh, province, we are not too concerned. Uh, we are just going to build that middle metropolitan variant. <clears throat> that being said and done, let us engage a little bit more in some politics. Quick look at our heir, and of course he's ahead. Meanwhile, our faction leader is qu pretty old. He should die in about, like, you know... By the time he reaches 60, if we are lucky, however, he could die any time at the moment because he's he's really, really old, guys. Uh, that being said and done, we can go ahead and even upgrade Stratonike. Stratonike has actually a lot of Gravitas. Hmm. So, you know what? I'm actually going to improve the authority of Stratonike. Uh, you know, kind of bump her up as much as we can. Uh, we can improve her zeal, so she should have the maximum zeal now. We need to educate some characters. We don't have the money in order to do so, but we can send Stratonike on a, a vacation, giving her that final rank and, in fact, even improving her cunning. In the next turn, we should be able to get Stratonike up to 10 authority, and then I'm going to use her, since she has the highest gravitas, to upgrade Laodike. That being said, done a very quick look at our politics. Politics-wise, we are looking really, really good. Uh, we do want to recruit some more uh, local nobility because they have the lowest of, uh, you know, loyalty. However, it's nothing too concerning. Plus nine loyalty is actually really good. Uh, that being said, done. Let's have a very quick look at our settlements. Nothing much to build, and even if we had, we don't have the funds in order to build it. Kind of nice that we are slowly growing in Galatia at Cappadocia. However, it is pretty slow. Um, but what we can do over here is we can actually build a, a barracks eventually. I don't want to unlock this uh, building just yet. And the reason being is I don't have enough funds, which means I will be at a risk of generating a slum. So I think the idea over here is to kind of march through Edessa back towards Antiochia, get a couple more of these uh, Silver Shield pikemen, replenish along the way. Uh, so let's go ahead, end the turn, and I will see you all in the next turn. Um, and we should be able to easily pincer her out. Uh, you know, the remainder of the Kartli. They do, of course, have the settlement of, uh, you know, uh, Saracena. Uh, however, let's actually go up and see what's going on in the north over there. Uh, I might actually, you know, just push and try to take out uh, Cyrenica uh, or Saracena. Perhaps just sell it off to the Phanagorians. Give them a little bit of an advantage against the Colchis. Uh, because, um, for the most part, the Greek factions up here in the north are fairly friendly towards me. And even if I do peace out the Kartli and leave them with just Cyr uh, Cyrusena, they might end up wiping out uh, the Bosphoran Kingdom and posing a threat to me. So I will basically have to see how that goes in the future. Alright, welcome to the next turn. And as you can see, the Parthians are negotiating peace uh, with some factions. And that is because they actually offer to become our satrapy, which is actually great for us. Which means we don't actually have to conquer Nisa. We can actually just keep sending our dignitary towards the region and we can acquire Nisa peacefully. Meanwhile, we are going to move, uh, you know, our <coughs> governor general into Sadrakata to help with that cultural conversion. We have 26 influence, which should mean that we should be able to get... Hellenic to be the dominant culture within the region. Meanwhile, we can send our other dignitary down towards Hecatompylos. Um, our other dignitary is marching across the Syrian desert, trying to make her way towards Susa. Susa, of course, is uh, you know still slow with its cultural conversion, but once we get our temples, then we should be in a pretty good uh, position. Uh, that being said, done. A uh, quick look at our army over here. We have taken a little bit of. Uh, Attrition, what's going on over here? Do we have a very brutal summer? 
and I think we do, so we don't really want to <laughs> march into, uh, you know, into um, Yehuda. So we're going to just hold off a little bit on that. Meanwhile, we are going to attempt to assassinate this character. Hopefully, if we succeed, and once again, the spy has been wounded, unfortunately. Um, can go ahead and upgrade these units. We can go ahead and attack these units and pretty much wipe them out. I am going to take a little bit of desert attrition, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, I cannot wait any longer. So let's just go ahead, just kill off the Kyrenes. Go ahead and enslave them. Wipe out the faction. We have leveled up. We are going to continue to take a lot of desert attrition. We're going to try to move up north as quickly as we can. We're still going to take that desert attrition, unfortunately. We might, in fact, even lose a couple of elephant units over here, which is rather unfortunate. But it is what it is. Um, let's see. Yeah, we, we could end up losing some elephant units. Hopefully in the next turn we will be able to just squeeze our way back towards, you know, more hospitable lands. Uh, that being said, uh, up here in the north, quick look at the situation. We can see that uh, we can pretty much attack Mishkera from both sides, thereby completing our pincer moves. So let's go ahead and just do that. Uh, we have another army over here. We can go ahead and attack this army, kind of move it from the settlement however they're going to stand and fight which means i get a hundred percent auto resolve we can go ahead and auto resolve this one as well so let's go ahead and do that and with that we have managed to acquire mishkera we're going to loot the settlement because it is of uh, you know um georgian culture i don't know what exactly this culture is called but it is basically the proto-georgian culture which is the caucasian culture nice. meanwhile we can move our spy up north towards Saracena. we might actually end up piecing out uh, you know, um, the Kartli over here because it really doesn't make any sense to keep pushing up against them. Meanwhile, what we could do is actually move towards Kabbalah, uh, try to conquer the settlement for ourselves. Uh, with the Kabbalah, they're actually at war with the Scythians, which is actually quite interesting. Um, so yeah, we might try to actually snipe Kabbalah from the Scythians. Uh, sorry, from, of course, the Ardhan. And a uh, quick look if we have some population class over here. We do Ready not. So we can actually move towards Fasis. Hopefully try to get some replenishment up and running. Because we're not going to replenish in Miskera since we just recently conquered it. Um, but do we have a little bit of population going on over here? So we do have that, which is good news. Uh, meanwhile, uh, our Megas Basileus has leveled up. So let's go ahead and give him all of those abilities. Uh, meanwhile, this character over here, we can move him back towards... Uh, you know, Syria, so that we can get some of those Silver Shield Pikemen. We can go ahead, put him on that patrol stand so that he gets a little bit more replenishment. Uh, we want to maximize our replenishment in our non-recruitment provinces because we don't really use the population within our non-recruitment provinces, um, which means that by replenishing from our non-recruitment provinces, we do not hamper our own uh, you know, abilities to recruit from within our recruitment provinces. Speaking of recruitment provinces, let's go ahead and build that barracks in, of course, Galatia at Cappadocia. Meanwhile, a quick look at Iconian. Iconian is still only two out of four buildings. Pessinus, we are looking at three out of four. Uh, so we pretty much want to start consolidating Asia, honestly, so to speak. So I am going to try to focus on, you know, subjugating the Rhodians. As I mentioned, I'm going to subjugate them, give them control of Pergamon after, of course, I conquer Pergamon. And then I'm going to take out Rhodos from them so that they use their growth rate to upgrade Pergamon to five out of six buildings, which means uh, once I acquire Pergamon for myself, I will be able to instantly upgrade it to seven uh, sorry, six out of six building slots. Uh, that being said and done, I don't think there's much else left to do in this turn. However, um, I don't think there's much left to do in this episode, that being said and done. Uh, but what we can do instead is we can actually initiate a peace deal with, of course, uh, the Kartli. We're going to make them pay us heftily for it. We could make them a satrapy if we don't ask money. Nope. I'm not interested in making them a satrapy because they kind of pissed off all these northern factions. So I have very little interest in, uh, you know, making enemies up in the north because I have very little interest in conquering these regions for myself for the moment. Uh, we do bother the Igarimen 
They are at war with the Romans that are making some significant gains in Africa. So I'm not going to initiate any of those diplomacies with them. Uh, we have currently no diplomacies with the Romans. They have managed to, you know, kind of break all of their diplomatic agreements with us. So um, ex with the exception of the non-aggression, we might be able to get a trade agreement with them. You know what? I'm actually going to cancel my military access. Uh, cancel as much of the treaties I have with these eastern factions in the hope that of course the Roman faction will like us a little bit better because I'm not at the moment entirely prepared to fight the Roman faction. Okay, so they will not agree but if I offer to join the war against Carthage then I will take a diplomatic hit I'm pretty sure because I just recently cancelled the military access with Carthage. So pretty much the focus is going to be next uh, dealing with uh, the Mamlakat and Nabata. For now let's just uh, pay off the debt over here. Quick look at our politics. Uh, we can go ahead and get that final level of authority for this character. So let's go ahead and improve Stratonike. Meanwhile, we can even educate some of our other characters. So let's go ahead and educate two Sididays. Um, finally, we can send Stratonike to improve her cunning. So let's go ahead and send her on a vacation. And in the next turn, we can begin to uh, use her to improve. Hmm. We can use her to improve uh, the authority of Laodike. So for politics, as far as politics is concerned, we're looking quite good. Meanwhile, we are going to send our dignitary to Parthava. Keep trying to acquire provinces from Parthava. Uh, we are also going to try to improve the public order. We can improve the public order in Hairston. Uh, and finally, what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick look at our settlements. We definitely want to, uh, you know, build up and not leave any open slots in which slums can develop. And uh, yeah, that being said and done, I think my settlements are looking quite good. We've managed to kind of build up a pretty significant or decent treasury. We're making about 14,000 denarii per turn. Uh, not much of an improvement economically, so to speak. But as you can see, Egyptos is making 18 or close to 19,000 denarii per turn. That being said and done, I'm going to go ahead and end the episode. So I thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. And if you like the video, then like the video. And don't forget to subscribe if you are interested for more. Peace and love.